There we are. Can you see that it's live as well? Yeah. yeah. We sh should be live. Hopefully some people will come and join in our chat. <laughs> Fab. But I'll just give it a minute and um, make sure that I can see comments and that. I can you see comments as well? I can. I think I can on the right hand side. I can see Great. comments. So live viewer comments. Yeah, this is an yep. example. Yeah, brilliant. Fab. There's usually a bit of delay, but like I say, I can usually see them as soon as they start to come in. Then um, we'll get. Oh yeah. yeah. So we've got some people now. So um, if anybody's watching and just above the video. Uh, if you click on the link, then you'll be able to grant StreamYard permission for us to see who you are. So um, if you don't, I just see Facebook user. So um, please don't be uh, offended if I don't know your name um, because you can see it, but we can't. <laughs> so um, yeah, drop a hello into the box so that we can see that um, it's all working and then we can get cracking. So, um, oh, brilliant. Hello to Julie and Kim, lovely. So we've got some people joining. So I would like to uh, introduce a fantastic trainer who I've had a massive amount of respect for. Um, Kamal, thank you for coming and joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. No, that's brilliant. So um, for those of you who don't know Kamal, um, he's an amazing trainer. He's worked with a huge range of dogs um, mm -hmm. over the years, um, like myself, has a passion for Border Collies. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, would you like to introduce yourself, Kamal, and tell everybody a bit about yourself? Yeah, no problem. And thank you very much, obviously, for uh, for asking me to. It's a privilege to speak in, in any forum. Um, and, you know, obviously, a, a, a plethora of Border Collie owners is always a good thing. So my name is Kamal Fernandez. I am a professional dog trainer and dog sports coach is my official role. But I also work a lot in behaviour. Um, and I teach internationally. Um, I'm very fortunate that I am able to follow my passion, which is dogs and dog training and dog behavior, and fortunately make it my vocation. Um, I've been doing this for now oh, 30 years, <laughs> so a few years. I don't, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to glance over that number, but I've been doing it for a little while. Um, and I started off um, with, like most people did, I got an unruly pet dog. I had a passion for dogs as a, as a kid. I got an unruly pet dog, which was actually a Chow Chow Cross um, Border Collie. And mm -hmm. um, she came with, as you can imagine, a plethora of behavioral problems or ones that, to be fair, we created as innocent dog owners or naive dog owners. And um, she was the springboard for which I then started training dogs. And I got my first Border Collie, um, Ty, who was um, a, an amazing dog, an absolute incredible dog and I was had um very lucky in that I did quite well with him in a competitive dog sports um and it just springboarded from them and and you know border collies are absolutely my type of breed you know they're active they're intelligent they want to do things and between them and Malinois they're the only two breeds I would always own in my you know I have had a lot of different breeds um I've had you know Labrador Kelpie Cross German Shepherd Cockapoo, Boxer, Spitz, you know, and a plethora of breeds, but Border Collies and Malinois are the only two breeds I would always, always own. So what is it about those two breeds that um, draw you to them like that? Because obviously there's similarities, but there are some differences. There. Yeah, absolutely. There's similarities, but there's absolute differences. So um, the, 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 what for me definitely is their energy level. Yeah, I'm a very high energy person. I'm a very active person. Um, I'm quite an intense person in terms of things that I do. So they absolutely fit my my being. And I think that's really important when you're taking on any breed of dog. And I think that it's worth doing um, <clears throat> extensive research into a breed and not just speaking, looking at books and what you find on Google, meeting them, meeting the owners, meeting the breeders so that you really understand what they are in terms of full on to live with. And that means warts and all. You know, I think people often get... Uh, you know google and the internet can create uh, almost uh, you know a very the pitchy oh you know you see the you know the board poly on you know um babe where it's just you know being this friendly uh, little dog and sweet and cutesy wootsy and then you realize oh jesus it comes with all these issues um so i think that certainly for those types of dogs i like high drive dogs i would always gravitate to a dog that has a load of energy um and when i've had you know i've had dogs from puppies i've had dogs that are rescue dogs i've had re you know rehome dogs I would always gravitate to a dog that had abundance of energy. So that's the first thing that I look for. I love that athleticism. Um, you know, for me, I do dog sports and that, that Border Collies are the ultimate dog sport enthusiast dog, really, the, the breed. You know, they are successful in every single sport that 
has been, you know, from obedience to agility to man training to tracking to every single sport. Border Collies are so versatile. They're so capable. Um, and it's their intelligence. And it's the similar entity with the Malinois. With the Malinois, you get more... Um, you do have the aggression aspect or the aggressive aspect of them, and they have much more intense prey drive. So I, the way in which I explain it to people is if my Border Collies and my Malinois are chasing um, a, a rabbit, hypothetically, or if they were to chase something, my Border Collies would be chasing after it for the sheer joy and the exhilaration of running, and that would be their thing. My Malinois would be looking at the small thing that they want to disembowel and eat. And that's the most basic as, as analogy that I can possibly explain between the two breeds. Um, and whilst I love them both, um, and I would, as I said, I would always have both, um, there is, uh, I find Border Collies easier uh, in terms of uh, as being like, if if I'm out for a walk and I have 11 dogs, I can head count every single one of my Border Collies. I can, they will always, always be within um, you know, 20 foot of me, whereas my other breeds will definitely go off and range a bit further, um, which is fine. You know, if you have control, it's not a problem. And if they have a recall, that's not an issue. But it's most definitely um, um, border collies are much more for me. Certainly my border collies are very much more. They gravitate more to you. One of them's actually gravitating right now. There you are. Oh. <laughs> She's lesser. <laughs> Wanted to do it again. <laughs> Sorry. She wanted to join in, show everybody how perfect yeah, 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 are. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> so, um, obviously, you mentioned about doing dog sports as well. Mm -hmm. So do you do the same sports with both breeds, or do you have one breed for one sport, one breed for another? Do you cross them over? How do you no, so, so I've, uh, I mean, I've over the years, I've done a lot of different sports. I've done obedience and agility and working trials and IGP, and, uh, you know, I've done a lot of different dog sports, and I would say... Border Collies are very, very versatile. They they have the ability to, what I'd say the difference with the Border Collie is that you can probably excel in any dog sport with a Border Collie. Whereas I'd say with a Malinois, there is like, say for example, I'm going to pick agility as an, an example. If you put the best Border Collie up against the best Malinois, I would say the Border Collie has the edge because it's got that more um, flexibility, um, it's nimble, it's quicker, it's uh, where I say it's quicker, it can probably turn tighter, which from a, a sports perspective just gives them that little bit more, um, a little bit more of an edge over, say, a big striding Malinois. In terms of my dogs, I like to, I've always liked to cross discipline, um, uh, sport, train them. So I will always dabble in a lot of things because I believe that gives them um, better training. It creates them to be more well rounded. It also, um, um, for breeds like Malinois and Border Collies and why I think there's so many behavioural issues with them is they they have this quest to work. They want a vocation. And for me, that's what's part of creating them being content and, and avoiding behavioural problems developing is really utilising their brain and their physicality. So um, the more that you do, the, the happier that they are. And I, I mean, certainly with my first Border Collie, I trained that dog so to, to do so many things. I mean, he, like he had like, I, I've lost track of the tricks and behaviors and verbal cues he had and the things that he could do. You know, I did everything with him because he was that he was a, a typical border collie that wanted to learn, you know, and wanted and relished um, just um, engaging with me. And I think that's something that the breed is very, very, um, it's part of who they are, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I am um, my, uh, my members and people that know me all know that I, I talk a lot about meeting our dog's needs Absolutely. and our collies can have quite a few needs um, mm -hmm. in terms of physical and mental stimulation. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously at the moment you've got a big project going on, which sort of links into this quite nicely because yeah. um, I refer to collies as uh, needing a job and yeah. if not, they will find themselves a job. Um, yeah and yeah. go self-employed so mm -hmm. that can in itself cause um many issues um yeah. or not necessarily issues for the dog but issues for us as unwanted behavior so yeah. um, could you talk a little bit more into that and what you're doing yeah. at the moment yep so at the moment and it actually closes today is uh, i've been working on a project for the last couple of years called relabeling reactivity so the I uh, the the concept of reactivity has become um, more and more prevalent. And I would say, um, probably the last five years, the co the notion of the or the label of the the term reactivity has been applied to dogs that are you know 
um, car chases to over exuberant Labradors and, and everything in between. And it frustrated me um, because most of those dogs were actually, and, and the stigma that came with that label. And it frustrated me and it um, uh, made me really think about um, how dogs are perceived and um, how we can actually improve their behavior or deal with some of these core issues by just simple dog training effectively and and you know as you said meeting their needs needs so i actually the original thing that i did was i did a seminar called relabeling reactivity where the the premise was about breaking stigma and giving people um first off identifying what's the cause of why are dogs re reactive um and also um what contributes to their reactivity so the last week i did what was called the reactive the relabeling reactivity symposium where i talked about this extensively in which i had um several people that are contributing to the course um speak and we talked about like the the effect of reactivity how it can certainly affect um as an owner's confidence and so forth and so forth um and the the course of just came organically from that as i you know more and more people were asking me for advice about dogs that had been labeled reactivity reactive i should say and it was really as a as a professional dog trainer, I was almost having to convince them your dog is not a problem dog. It just needs to these subtle little things or these little tiny things which are going to make all the difference. So from that and talking to um, you know, I I don't work trained obviously dogs several, you know, I don't know, I've lost count of dogs that I've trained that had been deemed reactive and we'd improved their behavior and we'd had some successes with them. And I essentially wanted to share that with more people and um just to give people a little bit of hope really because i think um there's so much information there about reactivity and and almost that um perception that the dog it's almost like a crowd a shroud of shame really and i and i just really that really frustrates me about dog ownership and behavior in general um so it as i said i the course was is a basis of dog training very simple um training. it also has it an also has where Oh, I've, I think I've got feedback there for some reason. Um, we can just... still hear you. Oh, okay. Um, so the course is made up of just simple dog training that anybody can do. It's not, you don't have to be a, you know, a world-class dog trainer. You don't have, you could be a first time dog owner and it's just simple things that you can teach. So simple core skills is one thing. So then the other entity as well, as you've mentioned, if you don't give your dog a vocation, it's going to make work for itself or it's going to become self-employed so there's a whole section that covers um nose work and and because i for me nose work is such a great way to um uh, for a lot of dogs i'm not saying all dogs but for a lot of dogs one it's low impact two it's um a great way that the dog can be in a controlled manner so on a long line on a harness it can have a, an outlet for its energy which is both physical and mental um and the person that i asked is a very good friend of mine who is a, a, an expert in the in a field of nose work she is um a, a search and rescue um instructor she's trained several dogs of our own to be search and rescue dogs she's been involved with police dogs she also was involved with a project where they were um identifying um cancer and uh, teaching dogs to find cancer cells in humans she was a hearing dogs for a um, deaf trainer so she's a very very well-rounded dog trainer and i asked her to be part of the project and the other bit which is massively um, crucial with reactivity is primarily what dog trainers do is we focus on the dog we go how do we train the dog and as a professional my previous vocation i was a police officer and i worked a lot with young offenders and i worked a lot with um victims of crime um and really contentious issues and it, it that that the skill set i had there was working with people no settle that um that had been victims of trauma and there were so many parallels to people that had invert commas reactive dogs and the almost a level of PTSD and the stigma that was attached to a dog that behaved like what dogs do, lunging or barking, et cetera, or getting an altercation over the park and you then having somebody shout at you and tell you you're the worst person in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, your dog should be muzzled and all the stuff that goes with that scenario playing out. So I caught, reached out to to a friend of mine who um, she runs an online yoga um, business um, or yoga platform. And, and how yoga can be a way to help people with um, anxiety and breathing techniques and self-awareness. And the other entity, which is really unique to the course, is that I um, have a person that is a, a licensed therapist. So she's a therapist and she works extensively with, with anxiety and PTSD and, and stuff um, related to mental health. And that to me was the, the real icing on the cake because it meant that not only could we support the dog training entity, there was an entity 
there is a consideration for the person on the end of the lead and for me that's that's an absolute that's that's the combination that you need and whilst the course is not a substitute or or purporting to um you know be a a way to fix any mental health concerns or issues it is talking about it is giving the people things that they can do for themselves and having that candid discussion about it without judgment and as i say the stigma that's often attached yeah i think that's it's so important to include that part um i i relate from a horse that i used to have who mm -hmm. um i suppose i'd never thought of her as being reactive mm -hmm. but um she would spin and run in the other direction. She mm -hmm. would rear up. She would um, spook when you didn't think there was anything there to mm -hmm. spook at. Um, so riding her around an arena, every corner I approached, I'd, I'd never realized when I was on her that I was doing it, but I would tense up so that I was ready in case she I, did something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I got on other horses, I felt like a right lemon because I, <laughs> I would be tensing up and they're just mm -hmm. trotting along, doing nothing. Yeah really makes you realize how you mm -hmm. start to react mm -hmm. even if the dog isn't reacting yeah 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 so, um yeah i don't know if you've heard there was a um there was a great research paper about mm -hmm. again it to do with the interaction between horses and people mm -hmm. and they put heart rate monitors on the horse and the handler mm -hmm. and they got them to walk along a stretch and mm -hmm. um told the owner that nothing was going to happen mm -hmm. it was fine Mm -hmm. And then they told them that they were going to have a person standing there. And as they walked past, they were going to open an umbrella. Mm -hmm. And the person stood there, but didn't open an umbrella. So mm -hmm. nothing different happened. Mm -hmm. But the human's heart rate went up in each of the mm -hmm. cases. And the horses reacted, even though nothing else changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So that was the human part and their headspace, making them the horse speak. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, even so again like, i mean i could talk you know extensively about this conversation so um i i'm trying to i keep on wanting to get um and it's just finding the right people to get on board the project i'd really really love to put together would be to look at um mental health and dog behavior and and i talked about this recently i did a talk for um some university um students um via zoom and the pandemic um and a lot of them were from um getting into animal behaviorism uh, behaviorists and they were looking to be animal care professionals and i was saying that how you know it, i think it's such a, um a, a critical piece of work that could be done and if there was a you know um and actually i'm um just prior to she's actually recently had a baby i was talking to somebody else about this project about looking into the connection between you know mental health concerns and and dog behavior because i i absolutely think that it's a conversation needs to be had and some research about it it's just collating all the people that have the relevant expertise um so i, I that would be something i i'm i keep on like gravitating back it's just like everything else it's like finding the right moment and the time but you know the conversation about you know uh, that self-awareness mental health is becoming much more open where we can have the conversation without you being labeled as crazy and mental etc and the, the the natural um you know we have that dogs are genetically hardwired to connect with us that's why that's how it all started a million years ago a billion years ago when you know wolves come by the campsite whatever it was there was that connecting of beings four-legged and two-legged and certainly for a breed like a border collie they are we've almost within that we've selected them to be absolutely ultra connected with us to respond to the most slightest of noise or the slightest re respond or the slightest little bit of body language they're meant to respond in that manner so if you think about if you're feeling anxious if you're feeling concerned if you're feeling excited that's all going to go down the lead to the dog or even without the physical connection of the lead it's going to absolutely resonate and as a, um, a dog sports coach one of the massive parts of my role is to equip the trainer with the skills not only the dog training skills, but the mental skills, like the mental um, 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 composure and sports psychology aspect of readying themselves for, um, you know, my students have competed at world championship level at crafts, et cetera, from, you know, one of them that I referenced, which is part of, she was part of the relabeling reactivity symposium was um, a student that had a miniature schnauzer who um, she was a first time dog owner, got this dog, had a 
you know he had major behavioral issues he was sort of thrown out of dog training classes and you know they nobody would take the dog on and and the long and short of it and you can listen to extensively on my youtube channel is you know all the stigma that was attached to it and how part of um our journey together was building her confidence up in the dog but also a huge part of that was getting her head in the right space of saying like right focus on the task at hand you know blank out the environment let's just you know give you things to do like cope like the uh, techniques that we used with her which actually ultimately helped her deal with situations away from the competition field and there were so many parallels about self-awareness your breathing you know um control what you can control you know don't worry about the things that, that are beyond your you know your um your influence as it were so there's definitely a to me i think there's a massive amount of work to, that could be done and um my uh, what i brought to that sort of that conversation is relabeling reactivity to give people just the beginnings of and as i say you know the things that i've got planned for the course are you know at the tip of the iceberg into what could be done but it's a starting point and it's having that candid conversation really yeah wow mm. so um i i you won't know this come up but probably the first um first time i met you in person was actually at one of your relabeling reactivity um workshops mm -hmm. um i hadn't got a dog but i'd come along to watch and learn and i can right. the, it's funny, isn't it, how you remember certain dogs and certain people that um, attend. Yeah. And um, it was a real, it was a real wide range of dogs. And mm -hmm. I remember the two at the opposite end of the scale. Um, mm -hmm. And one of them, I can't remember now exactly what the owner said that the dog mm -hmm. did, but couldn't get its attention in public at all mm -hmm. um, and reacted to everything in the environment. Mm -hmm. And the little dog got away from her and it ran over to the person next to me and mm -hmm. nicked their treats from under their chair. Mm -hmm. And so that owner gave the dog owner her treats. Mm -hmm. And after that, dog didn't react to anything because mm -hmm. she'd got chicken. Yeah. And all of a sudden, she had value for actually yeah. working with her. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't really refer to that dog as reactive, but she felt that it was because mm -hmm. she didn't know how to get mm -hmm. its attention. Yeah. Um, so it it literally can be any any part of the scale can't absolutely. it absolutely absolutely um, and i think yeah. there's a lot of misconceptions about what dogs are as opposed to um so there's the disney you know i blame disney a lot for um uh, the way in which we perceive dogs that you get your puppy you bring it home and similar to your iphone you plug it in and off you go and it doesn't work like that you know you have to be you know i i've had you know 21 dogs in my life you know uh, a, a lot of dogs a lot of different breeds I've not had one dog that I could say, oh, we didn't have a something to deal with, a challenge to overcome. Now, some dogs, it's been minimal. I mean, the challenge has been hardly, you know, worth noting. Um, uh, some dogs have been pretty extreme. Um, but when you get a dog, you sign up for it's And the way in which I equate it is, imagine any um, spouse, sibling, child, partner, any relationship that lasts approximately 10 to 15 years. Tell me now if you've never had a a, a crossword a fallout tears tantrums whatever you've not had it's just not reality so if you're going to have this living breathing being in your home for 15 years approximately you're going to have ups and downs but it's the disconnect that we don't quite um, anticipate that with dogs and people have sometimes unrealistic expectations especially for breeds like you know border collies or malinois etc certainly border collies i mean it's really funny that when i and how um, breeds tend to be um, uh, geographical. So when I was in London, the primary type of breed I would deal with would be Staffordshire Bull Terriers, um, Pit Bulls, you know, Kenner Courses, all that real extreme like type of dog. When I've moved down here, I primarily used to deal with farm bred border collies, farm bred border collie mixes, um, gun doggy types, etc. Because the, it's it's definitely within the the the, the uh, area and the culture of the, the area, for, so to speak. So what I very commonly got was people would turn up to my puppy classes with border collies that they assumed they went to the farm, they saw the parents, they met the parents, they were doing, being absolutely obedient and they've got their puppy and then they went, oh my God, why is it shadow chasing and car chasing and bike chasing and chasing my kids scooters and nipping the heels and obsessing about the hoover and all the stuff that that border collies are more than likely going to do and it's without giving them any vocation you know and a, a really great example of that was um 
a, a, a lovely lady that come to my trading classes with a border collie called Emma. And I talk, I wrote a blog about her and she's actually in um, the relabeling reactivity ebook. And um, she brought this, uh, got this puppy. So the backstory was she'd had border collies before, but she'd had rehomed or um, um, dogs before and they were a semi-trained. I can't remember where they specifically came from, but they were older dogs and they had some training. I don't know if they were sort of um, failed police dogs or something along those lines, but they were, they'd had a level of training. So they walked into a house and it was the iPhone scenario. She plugged it in they, and she would say, she said the dog never put a foot wrong. And then she sort of thought, right, I'm going to get a puppy. She has this little small holding and she contacted the local farmer who she knew and he had a litter and she bought this puppy. And this puppy was phenomenal. I mean, an absolutely awesome dog, an incredible brain, but every border collie problem. And she was really, really struggling with how to, like the dog would come into up the hall on two legs. It'd be screaming its head off if we did any movement. I mean, when I say movement, I mean, throw a tidbit six foot and the do another dog move and, and do a recall. And this dog would hit the end of the lead and go absolutely ballistic. So we had to do a lot where, she would train the dog in the corridor and the doors would be closed. One of my trainers or I would work with her. Then we'd have the door just slightly ajar. And then we'd gradually bring the dog into class for five minutes when it was a quiet exercise. Then we'd take her back out and so forth and so forth. And the irony is, is that she really was at one point, I actually said to her, like, look, if you are really, really, you know, she really would openly say, I really don't like this dog. And I was like, that's no way to live. I said, yeah. If you don't like this dog, I said, let me find it home because I will tell you now the dog, somebody will snap my arm off this dog. And to give you an example about how brilliant the dog was, I did organize um, an, a tracking day and the dog literally, she was like she was put on this earth to do this. She just went bang, got it. It was like you put a pole on the ground, you stuck a harness and she just went bang, like absolute complete natural. Um, and anyway, long story short, she, bless her, Catherine, she was so determined. She just was like, no it's my responsibility. I've taken the dog on. I will figure it out. And I, you know, we worked for um, a good year, etc. And the difference now, the irony is it, she, this dog is like the poster child for well-behaved dogs. And, and the, the thing is she fell in love with, with training via that dog. So she, her previous dog, she hadn't actually trained. They just turned up trained this dog. Now, I mean, the amount of tricks that dog can do now, and it was like once she saw how brilliant the dog was with some with some input from her. Oh my God, the dog will pick up its right rear, back rear, front this one. This she'll go and pick this up. She'll do this. She'll stand on one head. She'll do a triple salco. I mean, like far beyond what she ever anticipated. And that's the thing that I think is really, really um, important to. And that was really down to her realigning her expectations of what she what she'd signed up for. And be willing to put the work in. I think that's that's a huge part of it's just dog ownership. It's not even breed specific. Yeah, and it's I think the the dogs that get themselves into trouble are quite often the genius dogs yes. that I'm working with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've got yeah. so much of a brain. If yeah. you can unlock it, then you've got your best mate, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's like my friend. Um, uh, Denise Fenzi. So Denise is, uh, runs the Fenzi Dog Sport Academy. Very good friend of mine. She's got a young um, Turv, a working line Turv, yeah. and she 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 did a really great, which I shared on my Facebook page um, live, talking about that dog and how he's got some reactivity issues. And she says, he, you know, he's potentially the best dog I've ever had because all great dogs have that borderline eccentricity slash madness slash whatever, you know. And it's the same with horses. You look at the great great horses. They all had a slightly, you know, borderline could blow at any minute. And it's the same with people. You look at the super successful sports people like, you know, they've all if you read things about them and I'm big into sports um, biographies and psychology of sports um, um, people. There's so many parallels to them, like, you know, that their intensity, that workload, wanting that and how a lot of them were problematic when they're teens because they didn't have an outlet for that that energy and then they found their passion and they focus and they took in it's so many parallels to border collies you know um and i think that's the thing to to really understand about the breed if you give them if you give them a vocation they are the best dogs in the planet but if you don't they're going to be the worst and they're going to let you know yeah. about it i i know with um obviously you know ding's history yeah. um yeah. but um i can remember saying to uh the person who um 
I adopted him through, um, he's like a three-year-old cult that needs mm -hmm. breaking in. And yeah. if you can stay on him for the first year, you'll get to the Olympics. Yeah, he's, yeah. His brain is amazing. Um, I've got to get through the behavioral stuff yeah. to get out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're fantastic. Um, yeah. 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 Brilliant. So I'm just going to look down through the comments. If anybody would like to ask Kamal a question, um, if that's okay with you, Kamal. Yeah, absolutely, no problem at all. <laughs> Have a look. There's um, there's definitely some people relating. Um, yeah. And uh, one lady said she's definitely been trained to be a reactive owner. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And Helen, I know Harley's behaviours make us anxious and that feeds back to her. Mm -hmm. So uh, it does. It's trying to break that loop, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, Elaine, uh, Denver has been called dangerous by other dog owners and needs to be kept on a muzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's hard, isn't it? With um, uh, When you haven't had, a, well, you've only had the Disney dog mm -hmm. um, or the general public have only had the Disney dog and mm -hmm. then you're trying to deal with your dog, mm -hmm. having somebody say things like that can really hurt, can't it? Because you're doing your best. Uh, the thing is to say is it's a bit like I always equate it to child rearing, you know, like so my my daughter's a vegan and she was I'm not a vegan. My daughter is. It was it was one of her mum's um, things that she wanted. We had a discussion about it. We both decided uh, uh, we had a very open discussion in which she said, I really feel passionate about it. I would like to raise her a vegan. And my stipulation was as long as she doesn't ever she's not unhealthy and she doesn't lack anything, then I'm all for it. I've got no issues not to. But um the amount of people that had nothing to do with us that felt that, that it was their right to sort of like give their two pennies worth. And I'm quite a robust person. So I was very easily, I can rebuff it and go, thank you very much. But this is our decision. I appreciate your, your interest. But um, there is a lot of people like um, her mum doesn't have that. She would have definitely, she took it much more to heart of like, why do people feel the need to encroach or, you know, a comment? Unfortunately, fortunately, that's society, how it works. You have to have a level of resilience and you have to go, uh, the thing I say to people is, where? what are your intentions? Are your intentions from a good place? Did you intend for your dog to go out this morning and bite somebody else's dog? No, of course you didn't. So alleviate that part of the, the, the pressure. You didn't intend for it to happen. We are all human beings. We all make mistakes. We all drop the ball. Every single one of us. I will do it with every single dog I've owned. I'll make some, a mistake with one of them. It's the, it's just the, the, the way the world works, unfortunately. And they obviously we I think as a collective, we should all be kinder to each other. And I think that what you've got to appreciate when somebody is, you know, um, when your dog behaves inappropriately to them, they are straight going into that um, fight or flight. mode. So they're feeling like they need to protect. So in that situation, I always say to people, don't take it personally because they're retaliating from purely a an emotional space. So once the situation has calmed down and I've had this where, I, you know, um, once the situation's calmed down and we've had a dialogue, the, the energy has totally changed, you know. Um, try not to hold on to it, to that um, that stigma of. And the other thing I'd say about muzzles is people have such an aversion about putting a muzzle on their dog. I would always muzzle train my dogs just as it, like my dogs don't need muzzles. Like, great, there's no muzzle. She wouldn't need a muzzle in her whole entire, but there may be an instance where, I don't know, she has to have, um, uh, I don't know, um, an operation and she's nibbling at her feet for something right what put a muzzle on her you know so why the stigma of it is such a it's ours again it's the disney thing of oh you see i look at lady in the tramp she had a muzzle on and she was like oh you know the bad dog to be truthful i would rather a dog be a muzz on a muzzle and it alleviates the tension from the handler so they don't feel like on edge like if anything untoward was to happen they know that their dog isn't going to do insurmountable damage so so first thing i'd offer is don't don't get it in your head that a muzzle is a bad thing um the other thing is and this is a, a, what people don't realize a muzzle can often be a visual deterrent to other people so if i have a really even if you have a dog that's super super friendly if you muzzle train them, you'll find that they'll do the thing that we would all like, which is everybody keeps their dog away from your dog. Yeah. So, uh, um, so I, I, I would say change the perspective about muzzles and don't, don't take it personally about, um, uh, or don't take it as your dog is a bad dog because it wears a muzzle. A muzzle is just a safety entity. It's a bit like wearing a seatbelt. Yeah. We all wear, we all have to wear a seatbelt. It doesn't mean that that you're bad, you're a bad driver, you're a good driver. It's just the way it, it is. You know. And the thing to say about muzzles as a whole and the similar to things like head collars etc is it's about keeping yourself and the dog safe 
And if it means it keeps you safe, it keeps the dog safe and it keeps other people safe, then let's do that as a beginning option and then work towards getting rid of it. All right. Absolutely. Great. Uh, so Anna says, this is brilliant. Good, good. Glad you're enjoying it. Um, thank you both for reminding us such important truths and sharing your incredible expertise. That's lovely. Um, Susan, uh, this could be Ben. He was so misunderstood. He just needs to find his thing that he enjoys. Yep. Yeah, they all need to find that mm -hmm. thing that they like. And um, it can be different for all of them, can't it? Um, Absolutely. And it, the irony on that is, and, I, and this, so again, um the societal um, influence of dog ownership is we almost have this thing in our heads of how we used to have children so there was a the mantra with children certainly with my generation and i'd say before was children should be seen and not heard and what that the 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 fallout from that ethos and that mentality actually is far reaching like whilst it's nice to have a child that's well mannered and understands social etiquette the mantra of being seen not heard actually caused probably more damage than good if we're actually being truthful about it. So, and it's the same with dogs. To have a dog, my dogs, I like them to, to be, you know, inconspicuous and to have manners, but I don't expect them to be cuddly toys. I expect that I'm respectful and mindful of who and what they are. I hopefully have taught them enough skills that either I can say lie down, sit and get control if there's something untoward going on. I don't expect them to be what they're not. Um, and definitely there's so much misunderstanding. But the other thing, talking about finding what your dog loves, surely that's the thing that we're all doing. As human beings, and I could get quite deep, we're all looking for the thing that gives us joy. If we can, surely if we cannot facilitate that for our dog, that's the thing that we should be actively doing. We should be looking for the thing that makes us full. You know, you're with me, brings us joy, makes us happy. Well, if, if we're looking for that for ourselves, and that's the, the life lesson, surely we should be trying to facilitate that for our dogs. And I think that's um, it's a really important thing to sometimes think outside the box with that yeah, because absolutely. it's easy to go, oh, my dog works for a tuggy toy or a ball or food. Mm -hmm. And some dogs need a bit more than that. Yeah, um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, I mean, obviously we talked about, you know, I, I – as I said, 95% of dogs, I'd say, really relish from nose work. There is, like you said about Ding, it actually increased his arousal. So you need to take a bit of an alternate route. The thing is to be receptive to, you know, the individuality of your dog and, you know, going on that quest to find what is it that this dog really loves to do? And mark my words, there's so many, you know, back in my day, and I'm sounding like I'm, you know, old and geriatric, but, you know, there was very limited options about dog sports. Now there is so many options of dog sports. You know, and if you've got a dog that has the capability, which a lot of border collies do, the world is your oyster. Yeah, um, it actually leads us nicely into the next question. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, it's something that I talk quite a lot about in the challenge that I ran recently mm -hmm. um, is your dog having a job to do. Mm -hmm. um, so Helen says, what is your definition of work? Any specifics? Work can be anything and everything that your dog undertakes as a task. So it could be, you know, picking up the, the, the letters in the morning. It could be closing a cupboard door. It could be, um, you know, doing a sit stay whilst another dog passes. It could be retrieving a ball that's been hidden in long grass. There's a plethora of things. It doesn't have to be specifically a sport, but it definitely needs a task that gives the dog um, purpose. So working breeds, border collies, malinois, that ilk, you know, even some gun dogs, well, a lot of gun dogs, they are genetically hardwired to want a vocation. It's it's beyond just, I equate it to a diabetic with insulin. We need to provide them with insulin. And it's critically important that we give them a purpose. And people that think that, that that's often said is, um, well, I just want to go out on a walk and just enjoy my dog walk. I enjoy my dog walk, but my dogs are under control and I have, um, I'm always aware of them. It would be like me taking my four-year-old down the high street for a walk i don't just kick back and go oh well i'm going to just like be on my phone i'm watching her because as a four-year-old there's a level of risk to her safety and other people's safety and i'm always aware of her presence and anybody that's a, a parent will i'm sure will equate to you no matter how old you're i mean i'm still my mum would wake up and worry about me and i'm you know pushing 40 it's like that's the natural evolution it's the same thing with dog ownership you know do you ever go out on a walk and just be able to tune out and and the dog Maybe if you hired a private field and you that would be great. But the reality is you should be always actively responsible. You should be present on that walk for 
engaging with the dog like hide a toy send it to go find it then let it go off and sniffing then sit wait do a recall you know then let it mooch around for a little bit of the walk so create that variety so that the, that it's interesting for you and the dog use that as your time to enhance your relationship yeah that's fantastic because i think sometimes people think about giving them a job to do is that you've got to go and work them on sheep or you've yeah, got to train them. and it's actually about life skills is a job yeah. for Border yep. collies and they yep. love the more information yep. you give them yep. the better they are aren't they yeah yep. wow. um allison says i find the unpredictability the most difficult uh thing to deal with yep. so um yeah that's um if we know what's going to happen it's mm -hmm. easier isn't it i would um, say so on unpredictability i would say uh, dogs are really unpredictable but what they can often be is the signs are so subtle and so minute that it appears to be unpredictable. And the other thing about unpredictability is it can often be created. So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into a dog that I had. So um, I had a, a Malinois probably, oh God, about nearly 20 years ago, and he was the first Malinois that I had. And when I got him, it was like, I mean, I was an experienced dog owner. I'd owned several Border Collies. I'd had a Labrador. I'd, you know, I'd had several dogs. I was, you know, I'd, been successful with those dogs and um I got this Malinois and it was like oh my god what the hell have I signed up for and um he was he was a dog that really wasn't he wasn't good with other dogs he was a dog aggressive he wasn't even reactive he was just dog aggressive and he didn't like other dogs he was fine once what he got to the point of where I could bring any dog into my home and he'd accept it no problem but if another dog crossed his path that a dog walk he would absolutely not suffer fools and at that point I was in my transition from being a, a traditional trainer to a, a, a reinforcement based dog trainer and um i um i had made the commitment to train my dogs positively for sports but i was still to be truthful using an element of um uh, punishment correction whatever you want to call it for my domestics and in truth what i did with him when he when he had his outbursts is i absolutely like corrected him and punished used punishment with him and what that ended up creating is he just learned not to give the, the the signs and he just would go he would appear to be unpredictable yeah all he was doing was he he read it as well you don't clearly don't like me growling and showing my teeth and giving the dog the side eye because you really really come down on me like a ton of bricks so what i'm going to do is just give you not do all those things and just bite the dog so it was a really steep learning curve in you know what i'd created excuse me <coughs> I trained in what appeared to be unpredictable behavior. So he would look to go from zero to 60. And actual fact, he wasn't. What I'd done is I taught him to. Now, I'm not saying that's the same instance for your dog. But what can often happen is growling is a classic sigh, a classic thing which people will chastise or correct their dogs for, or the side eye or teeth bearing. Those are almost methods or means of conflict resolution. If I give that dog the side eye, the dog moves away it's it's de-escalated the situation if that dog doesn't listen i'm going to just give a low grumble that should hopefully make the dog move away and so forth and so forth now um so what i actually had done was taught him not to give those telltale signs now there is always a line of teaching the dog other coping mechanisms because his response was so extreme when he did um, um behave inappropriately um i had to then do a lot of work of rehabbing his his um ability to communicate and i taught him alternatives so i taught him when another dog approached him what he was to do was to look at me intently and offer a sit and he that was my cue to go oh okay there's a dog coming he's uncomfortable and i would remove him from that situation so i retrained his uh, uh, alternative cues um that he could give me to tell me i'm uncomfortable in the situation can you please do something about it um he would also another thing he would do is if he saw another dog he'd grab his lead and he'd tug on his lead as a displacement behavior i allowed him to do that because i knew if he had his lead in his mouth he wouldn't let go of it so it meant that he was safe and i could maneuver him through situations so what he would often do at a dog show is he'd hold his lead and i would maneuver him around the dog show he wouldn't ever let go of his lead so i knew that was like his pacifiers for some for want of a term because i'd largely um you know, as i said i i'd, I'd handle that situation badly my learning curve with with um, my dog subsequently is to um be aware of those subtleties and also uh, be uh, sometimes some breeds are very difficult to read uh, like i'd say boxes as a breed can be very difficult to breed 
uh, read, I should say. Um, so it's the subtleties. It's the little muscles on the neck, of the back of its neck. It's the little turn away. It's the subtle little things that can then escalate. And as a dog owner, you want to invest in just observing, observing your dog in situations. For example, if you have multiple dogs, that's why I do most of my learning about my dogs. I observe them. How does that dog respond to that dog? What does that dog do to avoid conflict? What does that dog do to um how does that dog tell that dog no how does that dog invite that dog to play how does that dog um appease to that dog all those subtleties are information that i'm collating in my mind so when i interact with that dog i have this dictionary that's applicable to that specific dog about that dog's personality you know subtle little things about you know you know if they um tenacity and and, and and sensitivity and environmental factors i can you know i can watch read when i'm with my dogs and i can tell you know my dogs i could tell you with certain way for example punch i can tell you punch will be looking at me and i'll be looking at him and we'll appear to be totally and i can tell you oh a dog's just turned up just by the way in which he will just he'll just show a subtle little awareness in his being so as a a trainer i needed to work on that and just refine my skills but it is a little bit of a learning curve it's part of dog ownership really yeah that that really speaks to my relationship with ding um yeah. he never gave any warnings when i first had him um, and we go straight to bite um i i remember exactly the first time that he growled i almost had a party with him for actually growling i was so pleased that he'd shown um yeah. and communicated um mm -hmm. and the better our relationship got, the more signs he gave. Mm -hmm. So now you can just, like you say, looking at his eye, you can just mm -hmm. tell his eye just yeah, goes no. very still. Yeah. 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 Um, and then you can just remove him from a situation yeah. or, yeah. you know, yeah. tell him to do something else. So yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Um, so we've got lots of questions. Are you okay for time here, Kamal? Yeah, of course I am. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so um, Sharon says, I'm pretty sure Merlin's noise sensitivities become worse through my reaction to them now, as I'm always watching for them to happen. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, so it's just cycle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you have a noise sensitive dog, I always like joke with a friend of mine who has a, a noise sensitive dog about how she'll hear things like she's got like dog, like you could dog whistle and she'd hear it 20, 10 miles away. And I jest about it, but it is a relevant thing because, you know, when you see your dog respond so adversely to noise, you're, you the, the the caring part of you, the nurturing part of you wants to protect them and go, well, if I can keep them safe. And why, again, bringing it back to child rearing is you've got to fake it till you make it. So you've got to like, if my daughter falls over and bumps her head, blood is gushing from there and I can see a bone projecting, I go, oh, well, it's all fine. You'll be all right. Let me have a look. Now, internally, I'm going, oh, my God, oh my, what the hell is happening? Externally, I don't let her know that that's what I'm thinking. So because I don't want her to become to perceive that instance as, oh, my God, you know, um, and it's that's a real thing that I'd urge everybody to tap into. If the, the other thing is, if you're from a dog training point of view, um, you, there's obviously you can do desensitization and classical conditioning to uh, build up your dog's resilience to noise. And there's loads of things that you can do. But the big thing is just change your mindset about it. You know, like have a party when the noise, like get some treats out or get a toy and have a game when you hear a noise. So the dog starts to perceive the noise as a good thing and change it. The other thing is to develop an awareness of self. So if you feel yourself a little intake of breath, okay, so you're going to just like, again, it's cut, yoga is a great thing about breathing technique. Okay, just relax, relax your shoulders, you know, exhale your breath hand okay and move forward you know there's things that you can do physiologically to change your dog's behavior brilliant so um the next question um this one's definitely for you kamal i want to work bell but where do you go for classes for reactive dogs dogs mainly sometimes people so you can okay. definitely have this <laughs> yeah so that, in terms of classes that is the 64 million dollar question and um I, there is there's so much um, lack of continuity with classes, irrespective. So with dog training classes, you throw your cards up in the air and you hope that it lands with somebody that understands dogs and trains in a way that you feel comfortable with. As a little sneak peek, I'm working on a project to to remedy that, but that's going to be a little bit of, uh, in the making. But there is something I'm working on that hopefully we'll we'll deal with that. But for the moment, what I would say is, if you are obviously I don't know what area you're in, you could most definitely sign up to my fantastic course. But it might not be. I will say, and I and I really am clear about this. I I'm not here about doing a hard sell. Yeah, I would love to help people 
but you have to be again committed and willing to put the work in and also invested in the process so that's I'm really really clear in and some people aren't ready for whatever reason and if you're a person that wants um um that more one-to-one -one feedback then definitely not online learning probably isn't going to best be the best medium for you um but online learning is very very effective um for a lot of people because you have the visual entity you have um uh, written information there's loads of mediums of teaching but in terms of your dog and specifically i would suggest is going when obviously at the moment it's a great time to do some research about classes go and look for a class and i personally would go on recommendation yeah you know, speak to other dog owners put some stuff on forums and in your local your locality and reach out for people that uh, re come recommended go and watch a class first don't take the dog go and watch the class and see how the class is um structured so i and look at the number of instructors so i was very pedantic about we would have um i would never have more than six people per person in a class and as an instructor and if any more than six i would always have the minimum of two often three instructors in a class so that would be i would mainly be teaching and the two other people would go around and support anybody that needed help um, so you want to look at class numbers, you want to look at structure of the class, like the dynamics of the room. So think about, look at it from, if you had your dog in that environment, does the class have a space that dog can be moved to if it has, has an episode? Um, does the, does the, is the class structured in a way that is conducive to your dog's learning? Now, it might be that class might not be the first um, place that you'd start. You might have to book some one-to-ones with a person. And, and that would be, if I had a dog that was, um, that the person had stated it was reactive or had concerns about dogs or people, I would always, the responsible thing for duty of care for the dog and my other clients would be to do a one-to-one -one with the person first. That isn't, for me, it wasn't about making money. It wasn't like, oh, I needed to have, to, it was a way to say, is this appropriate for this person? Because there is no point you going to a class if you aren't going to learn and the dog's going to be stressed to the hill and you're going to be stressed to the hill. You're, it's just a counterproductive way of being. So what I would often do is do a series of one-to-ones. And when I felt the person was ready, I would then, I would allow them to come to my classes and I'd say to them, bring the dog in, don't pay for the evening. I want you to sit in the corner and watch and bring the dog in and you would drip feed the dog in. So they'd come to a class, they'd do five minutes, the dog would be back in the car. The next week would build up to you know 10 minutes and so forth and so forth now for me i absolutely get that not everybody will do that and go to that length and that's something that you need to be looking at if the person isn't willing to support you then maybe try an alternative okay and then you might think okay if i can't find a class locally then it might be um thinking about reaching to people online obviously sarah has um her, her group i have stuff online do your research about the people that you're looking at and and you want to make sure that you feel that they can connect with who you are. Yeah, so I'm very clear as an instructor, I am not all things to all people. I absolutely do not, that's not what I am. And no, mark my words, I've been in this industry long enough to know not everybody will suit everybody. And that's natural. So you need to find the person that you feel that you can connect with, that you feel that they're gonna support you. And you also um, like the way that they, they are engaged with dogs. And because to me, for me personally, the benchmark of, um, a dog training is I want to see them with their own dog and I want to see them interact with dogs personally that's my own personal opinion because if they can interact if they and I always look at their own dogs as a, um, a, a an indication of um, the testament of their ability yeah um, but it doesn't mean that if they've got a problem dog I'm not that's not a problem but are they working through those issues do they have they got a training plan in place are they compassionate to the dog's needs are they uh, are they using reinforcement based principles and so forth and so forth yeah so i i would say you know looking for a class again unfortunately it is the way the, the industry is structured you could find a class where there's more aversive punitive methods or you could go 10 minutes down the road and find one that's more reinforcement based it is very much luck of the draw but like all things it's about you as an individual doing the research fab and um where can she find you if um, she wants to look at your course. <laughs> yeah, so if you if you are interested, go to www.relabelingreactivity.co.uk um, and you can have a look at the um, the website. And uh, I've just released a little, um, excuse me, a walkthrough of the course showing you how it's laid out. There's stacks and stacks of information. And the thing to say is if you're, if you, if you're, um, if you're quizzical about joining an online uh, platform, there is, I, I release so much stuff on my Facebook page. Go and look at that, watch the lives, 
I've done several lives recently about reactivity. And, and if you go to my YouTube page, which is Kamal Fernandez Dog Training, again, stacks of information there about reactive dogs that you can start to just go, is this the right fit for me and my dog? Do I think that Kamal can help me? And if that's the case, then by all means, come on board. And um, at the moment, the plan for re relabeling reactivity is that we're closing tonight. But at some point, we will probably reopen. So it might be a case of, right, I'm going to go and do some research on Kamal. Does he, this is what, do I think he can help me? And then come to the um, um, table um, at some point later on, or reach out to me and I can certainly, you know, give you some advice and, and guidance about one, whether the course, when is the course likely to be open again? And if so, whether it's the right fit for you. Fantastic. Great. Um, and apparently your honesty made Alison cry. Thank Bless you. you. <laughs> um, Kirsten saying the mental health aspect and the feedback loop is so interesting. We got our pup only a few days after I lost my beautiful cat in a tragic, tragic accident and my head was all over the place. I think my anxiety is that something might happen to my pup have, um, may have impacted on her in the early days mm -hmm. and created some of our current problems. I'm going to look at myself more. If I'm calm, then she should be too. That makes total sense. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, great. And I, I, I just on that note, just to, to speak to that point, I've been in the position that you are in, Kirsten. And um, so um, I unfortunately had a, a, a spate where I lost very young dogs. I lost several dogs, under, uh, several, two dogs under the age of two. And it was very unfortunate circumstances around both losing the, both those dogs. And it was a, and it really took me till, if I'm truthful, to uh, having great for me to really let that go psychologically. So I had a real mental block, and that I didn't really train. I, I say I didn't train my dogs. I didn't do a lot with my dogs in terms of training until they'd reached two, because I had this thing in my mind that, oh well, I don't want to be bogged down with, you know, sitting straight and downing and competition stuff, because I thought, well, they're going to be. I want to just enjoy the dog for the first two years because they could be dead. And you go, that's such a counterproductive um state of being where i'm holding on to the stuff of the past and what happened with her specifically was um she was actually going to go to a friend of mine in the states and um i because my friend was having her i trained her relentlessly i was like right this dog's going to be absolutely what she can't do it by the time she flies in that plane will be not be worth living uh, 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 not knowing and um it broke the cycle and i realized i, I it made me realize my god like how entrenched and that that happened i lost those dogs um probably about oh god i think now 10 12 years 10 years ago 12 years ago and she's t she's just coming up three so that tells you how long i held that stuff for um so it is i, I absolutely can equate to you and uh, people will often get um uh, you know trying to i'm not going to say fill a void that sounds condescending but to 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 help themselves through sometimes it works brilliantly it gives you something to to, to to focus on but grief is a really 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 you know um as i said in my previous vocation i worked a lot with people that you know victims of um um crime or um supporting people who's um the family of people who had been you know unfortunately you know either murdered or really contentious things and you you realize that the stages of grief are something that we all have to go through and allowing it to happen is a natural part of that process and and it definitely for me uh, it was a huge thing that i just hadn't made peace with that like I, you know you 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 i don't know the circumstances around your dog uh, your sorry your cat i should say but for me i had a lot of guilt attached to that a real a massive amount of guilt of like it was my fault i was responsible yada 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 and um you know i really really beat myself up about it and um you have to at some point go let it go you know that is cliche but you have to let it go yeah yeah Okay, so um, I can't see who this is, but Cody wears a muzzle when in areas where off-lead dogs might be a problem. It does make people more aware of giving him space. And if anything does happen with people who have no recall, they often do not explode into confrontation as they can see we're taking precautions already. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. Um, Sally's asking, is there a particular type of muzzle that's better to start the muzzle training with? Yeah, my preference person is um, Baskerville muzzles, so the, the ones that are the baskets, so you can put treats in them. I like those personally than the ones that are, um, they used to be the Mickey muzzles. I, I generally don't use those. I would use a, a basket muzzle so that the dog, you can reinforce the dog and they can have a drink and it's just uh, easier to, to work with. Yeah. Um, 
Julie's saying it's making her feel better um, about having a muzzle. Whoops, I've just lost the comments. Uh, yeah, about Sam wearing a muzzle went out as I feel a bit of a failure, but it's difficult to give treats, go sniff, take a breath um, and some of the other exercises that we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, treat delivery is a little bit more challenging. Um, mm -hmm. It's the payoff um, is, is worth it, isn't it? Yeah. So a couple of things about muzzles and treats is use things like um, um, what's it? Uh, oh, God. Um, that's, oh, God. My mind's gone blank. So um so uh, salami you know salami that you can uh, that comes really thin what's it called um, that you can shove through the gap of the muzzles one option or using things like squeezy cheese is another option yeah. yeah um so you can adapt it yeah um using squeezy cheese or or treats that you can shove through the muzzle and the dog can eat um like stick treats or you can get tripe sticks and things like that it is a little bit more of a cumbersome i will say that but again like you say it's it's about adapting and using what you have and the 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 benefit of using a muzzle is far more you know it's going to keep your dog safe and keep everybody happier yeah yeah great fan of um primula and <laughs> the squirty yeah. cheese yeah um so Melanie says, even when Dylan is not in the house, I still jump if someone rings the doorbell in anticipation of his reaction. So, yeah, it's that loop, isn't it? Um, Helen, Holly seems very aware of other dogs in muzzles. I think it's from the rescue centre where highly stressed dogs were muzzled for safety. Because of this, I hadn't introduced the muzzle at all. Mm -hmm. So I suppose it changes just like different types of dog face doesn't it um yeah. how they read other dogs as well yeah and definitely and the other thing is is take it as a again as a, a little job to make it as a trick so i how i start muzzle training is i don't start with a muzzle i first create a loop with my lead and i teach the dog to put its loop his nose for the loop and then i would do get a um a, either kit a cone that you like a, you know they use for sports um and you could or uh, even just a paper cup, cut the end off and get the dog to put it in the paper cup and give it a treat through the paper cup. It's a great little thing for you to just do some relationship building and a bit of dog training. And what I'm looking for is the dog to actively seek out the cup where it is for a click. So the dog, it becomes the game. And then you can take that and you can do all weird and wonderful things with it. Teach the dog to put its head in a box, teach the dog to hide its eyes. So there's a, things that you can do with it grown from that simple behavior. But it's a great little project to work on. Yeah, definitely. Um, so fellow fellow trainer here, um, Justina, as an owner of Reactive Dog, I can only say it is a hard journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes for us trainers as well, it's hard to say, isn't it, that we've got yeah. a problem with mm -hmm. our dog. Um, but it's so worth the effort, not mm -hmm. only for your dog, but for your own mental well-being. Finding yeah. an expert and helping with reactivity is half the success. About, sorry, interrupting you. So by definition, every single dog I've ever owned has has been under the if you were to really look at what the the various definitions of reactivity all my dogs have been reactive but the difference is is that they have enough sufficient skill and enough training for their reactivity not to become problematic that's the distinction yeah. so every single in fact i would actively look for a dog that has behavior that could develop into reactivity like chase drive and prey drive and motion sensitivity and um, obsessive compulsive stuff i want those things for what i do because i can use use those and harness those for my gains that's the irony so if if i was to look for a dog tomorrow and i went to a rescue thing and they said oh my god that dog's a car chaser and a, a, a you know a light chaser but i'd go give me that dog give yeah, me that dog. <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, definitely. Uh, so Molly, as a, as a vet in a profession with high, um, extremely high prevalence of mental health issues, your comments on human mental health and animal behavior are fascinating. Yeah, there's been a lot about that recently as well. Yeah, and, and I spoke, um, I'm just doing, a, one of the, the things of, again, as part of the relabeling reactivity is um, uh, getting people to, so that's an exclusive group where there's more people that are going to be contributing. And actually Sarah and I are going to be doing a, a little talk on that as well, talking about uh, from her chiropractic background. But one of the conversations I've had, in, which will be coming in the next couple of months, will be with my very good friend, Hannah Capon, who is um, the founder of CAMS, Canine Arthritis Management, um, a very good friend of mine. She actually, we're really co-parents because she's got a dog that I bred. And um, um, we were talking yesterday, last night, about, um, you know, the, the fact that the suicide rate, I think, statistically in vets is like gone through the roof. You know, they're dealing with death, 
life emotion on a daily basis that is going to affect them and i think that whilst we can all get frustrated with our vets sometimes for for various things we also i think the whole thing is lead with compassion and kindness and and just be nice to people you know it doesn't take a lot of effort to just be nice and understanding and just stop and see things for from others perspective and if you want that want to be the receiving end of that when your dog is behaving inappropriately make sure that you're extending that to others because that's how karma works yeah definitely um so helen's saying that she needs to up her skills on observing and reading dogs behavior yeah i think that's just an ongoing thing isn't it really yeah and every dog yeah yeah um louise uh so how would you train the dog to look at you and give a sit distance or food so with that particular dog it was he was very toy motivated and he was very food motivated so um i would First, I did it with my own dogs. So I would have somebody else walk with one of my dogs. And as soon as he saw the dog, he would he would choose to look at the dogs. And he'd choose to look back at me and I'd reward that. And then I'd wait further. And he offered me, because he understood the concept of offering behavior, he'd offer me a sit and I'd click and play with that, play with him, sorry. Um, and then I would grab it, graduate that to bringing the dog closer. So he understood when the dog moved into him, he had to sit and look and I clicked and played. Then I would use another dog and a friend's dog and a dog that he initially knew. And then I would extend it to strange dogs and build it up. It was a process and it took time, um, but it was definitely worth the investment. I mean, he was, a, I mean, as I said, he was a dog that didn't like other dogs and he competed at the top level in obedience where one of the exercises is a 10 minute, well, it was a 10 minute downstay in a ring where there could be up to 60 dogs in, in a, uh, you know, in a space. And he would be, you know, two, three foot from another dog in a sit or a down with me out of sight. And he never, ever broke. You know, he understood he was trained to that point. And, you know, a dog show, if you go to a dog shows, you could have several hundred dogs there. And he would understand he'd be off the lead, working with me, away from me. He'd be sent to a designate. You know, all exercises that require him to be independent of me. But he was trained to the point of where he understood, you know, there's reinforcement, not an offer, if you do these following things. And also separately, I worked on and on, on his concerns and his um, uh, issues with other dogs. Brilliant. And I think it's um, sometimes it's easy with a reactive dog to think, I just don't want them to do that. Yeah. Whereas if you show them what you want them to do instead. Yeah, focus on what you want. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Change your mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, Julie is loving this, especially the psychological and mental health aspects, mm -hmm. as well as spotting the signs. So, yeah. And um, Justina, amazing, oh, has kind of <laughs> posted the link to Thanks, Kamal's book. Justina. Yeah. Look at that. That's great. I'll give you commission. <laughs> I think one of my lessons with Justine, I hit around the head because she wasn't listening to me. I'm not normally like that with my students. I'm not more compassionate. There's me preaching about compassion. And I think there's a it's on Instagram where she wasn't listening to me. So I got a figure. It's it's it sounds worse than what it was. And she was fine. After she walked up from that concussion, she walked, shook it off. Yeah. It absolutely fine. <laughs> it worked, didn't it? <laughs> she actually got it right the next time. <laughs> Oh dear. Uh, Susan, I think there is also a piece of work to be done about how to work with removing and managing dogs on control orders. Mm. Yeah, I get a lot of referrals from the police or so when I was in the London, uh, actually, I just, funny enough, I just had one the other week about dogs that are on control orders and then being um, um, required to do some sort of training. And yeah, I mean, uh, definitely there is work to be done but i mean oh gosh we could go on another tangent about you know control orders and dog anti-dog legislation but let's leave that for another day <laughs> susan's got the most beautiful collie you would love him He's oh, really? okay. yeah she's doing a great job with him <laughs> and yeah re the mental health connection when i got otis i badly struggled with anxiety mm -hmm. and sometimes i still do also, just getting him meant that I had to start walking in woods, parks, etc., where I didn't always feel safe. I have often wondered if he could have picked up on my anxiety or unease. It sounds like that's likely. Does that mean I have to work on my anxiety to have any hope of helping Otis? This is a okay. great question. A great question. So the first thing is to say is, okay, um, you're, th th this again, it's all about the stigma you're not struggling with mental anxiety you are a human being that is in, in experiencing what is the human that is going through what is the human experience at some point in all of our lives yeah 
You are going to have a moment in your life where you will feel anxiety, where you will feel depressed, you will feel, um, you know, uh, conflicted, whatever the case may be, that is, you're going to feel PTSD, that is the human experience. So reframe how you look at your, as if you're, there is something, you know, you're not, you're, you're just undergoing the human experience. In terms of, and that we have to be mindful, obviously, that the very prevalent thing in the media at the moment is the unfortunate, you know, um, kidnapping and killing of the girl in London, which is going to raise the our anxiety levels about, certainly for women, about, um, you know, walking in places on our own, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's what the media does to our system. And we've got to be, take, there is, there is a lesson to be gleaned from that, but it's really important that we don't allow it to, um, to create that unnecessary anxiety by taking more control. Okay, what can I do to help the, our situation? Can I, what appropriate measures to keep myself safe? So that's part of it. The other thing is it, don't look at it as um, any hope of helping yourself. Look at it as a, as a window of opportunity. I solemnly believe that everything happens in life for a reason, that you have got that dog for a reason that dog that specific dog is with you and i'm sure sarah will echo my points for a series for a reason the dog first so a little bit of an example i the actual first dog i ever owned was a little kelpie cross i mean when i lived in australia i had this dog and this dog was lassie literally lassie we picked her up from the, the rspca um and the reason we got her is because we couldn't afford a purebred dog so we got this crossbreed at kelpie um, and um, the expert in my neighborhood was my neighbor who just happened. The reason she was an expert is because they had a dog. That was the benchmark of their qualifications. And they said, oh, let's take the dog out for a walk. And they, I said, well, we haven't got a lead and a collar. And, oh, you won't need a lead and a collar. She'll just walk with you. And sure as eggs, are eggs, she walked with us. Like this puppy, 10 weeks old, no vaccinations, nothing, walked by my side. And I stopped at the, I can remember it. I stopped at the curb. She sat. I walked across the road. She walked with me. She never ran ahead. She met another dog. She sat with me. You go, that's not normal dog behavior. So what then happened is my dad got a job back in the UK and unfortunately we weren't in a financial position to bring the dog with us. You know, we didn't have any money. And also that at that point she would have had to be in quarantine for six months at least. And she, we hadn't had the dog that time. So there was a load of reasons why it wasn't justifiable. So when we came back to the UK, I badgered my dog, my parents about getting a dog. And that was the first dog that I got. She was the equivalent of Satan in a brown coat. But it's because of that dog that I am speaking to you now in this medium, because she wasn't a lassie. She said, you need to teach me. You need to educate me. You need to et cetera, et cetera. And she was the dog that to this day, it's her that's created what I do now. Because if I hadn't had that dog, I wouldn't be. If I had the first dog, she would have taught me nothing. And I probably skirted through life and been absolutely brilliant. I would have thought, well, that's what all dogs do etc etc but the reason that that i had scrunch uh, and and she's allowed me to do what i do so don't look at it as as a, a hope of helping it looking at it as you have that dog nothing happens by accident you have that dog for a reason and if it, anxiety and confidence is something that you struggle with or you've had struggles with or challenges with take this as an opportunity to embrace helping the dog and therefore helping yourself but it isn't a case of any hope and it all is lost it's looking at as there's light at the end of that tunnel and that dog is there with you yeah definitely i am um, yeah i had problems when i had ding and yeah. ding's problems helped me through my problems Absolutely. Um, which you wouldn't choose to put the two problems of ding and my problems together you yeah. definitely would um yeah. but he saved me and I saved him. Absolutely. So yeah. definitely help your dog. Um, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't see it as a block and don't blame yourself yeah. for not being able to help your dog. You absolutely yeah. can. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Um, Melanie's just asked, can you buy the ebook um, if you can't join the course or is the ebook only for those joining? No, so that you can buy the book, the ebook, and it's a, you know, it's a collation of, blogs and lessons and advice about training etc so it's it, it grew organically when i was putting the book to, this course together you can absolutely buy the book which it, you know that's a great starting point but if you sign up for the course anybody that signs up for the course will get it a, a free on the course and you're able to download it so but excuse me yes you absolutely can um purchase the book um and, and as my um and my agent justina has provided with a website um, you mentioned about commission i saw that bit <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Helen is asking, we muzzles. I would be concerned that a muzzled dog would not be able to defend herself if attacked by another. 
So in that instance, there's so many things to be said on that, but the, the response would be, hopefully that's not going to happen. Hopefully if your dog, um, um, if something untoward happens, I, I was just stepping in, hopefully the other owner will be there. And even in that instance, you'll find that a lot of dogs, uh, the concept of defending and attacking and re defending itself, dogs have to learn how to do that. They, that a lot of dogs don't fight naturally well yeah contrary to proper belief dogs don't know how to fight they have to practice it like all things and they don't naturally do it so in in most instances when you have an altercation with two dogs um most instances often it is it's more um uh, it looks worse than what it is is a very common thing Two, if you have one dog that's very well versed in uh, in attacking other dogs, it won't be the first time. And to be truthful, your dog having a muzzle or not having is going to make little effect if, if, to helping it. It's about being, you know, a, a practical and safe. But I would say the gains of having a muzzle for a dog that you are concerned about is going to far outweigh um, uh, because the likelihood is the person is going to be much more vigilant and keep their dog away from yours because you've got that visual deterrent. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kirsten, yes, Kamal, I do feel huge guilt over what happened to my cat. He was only two as well, um, and I feel I should have been able to stop it happening. I'm working through that, though, as I know it's not helpful. I'm actively trying not to catastrophize over the pup, um, as I know I have been. I think my fears have been impacting negatively on our interactions. It's difficult to not wrap her in cotton wool. Yeah, and that's a fact. You will go through that, so don't, don't beat yourself up about feeling that way that's a natural thing that you, but what i'd say to you is um think, work on yourself about letting go of guilt because guilt is so self-limiting and and uh, having been in that position you have to reach a point where you go this isn't serving me anymore and actually i'm not helping the dog um so again like um the other lady mentioned earlier use it as a medium and that's why i think all these things happen you have the dog that you have for a reason you know, the things have happened as they, and I know it's a cliche, I solemnly believe everything happens for a reason. And I look at the dogs, and again, it's like, I look at the dogs that, I, as I said, I lost. And they were, for me, they were incredible dogs, and they were ph phenomenally talented. And I was that point of my career where um, I was sort of on the rise, and, and they would have just made me look fabulous, which would have been great, would have made my ego wonderful. It wouldn't have made me the trainer that I am today. Because the dogs I got subsequently, one in particular, a dog that I recently lost called Scooter, he taught me about sensitive dogs, about um, empathy for um, when you have a dog and that he gave me so many more lessons than neither of those. Those two dogs would have made me feel good and they would have fed my ego and they would have probably given me success. But I couldn't empathize and I couldn't have this conversation if it wasn't the way things are. And I feel that makes me a much more round, uh, well-rounded teacher instructor and it makes me better at my job i.e helping people if i had had you know um, success on in the sports arena with those particular dogs i can't have this conversation why i'm saying to you guys really personal um things and discussions it's because of that experience and i whilst i you know would i've gone i wouldn't the irony is that i probably wouldn't change the way things happen because now i've come through it i can see all that i have gained and i and the, the course is the reason why i'm so aware of the, the the mental health aspect and all that our relationship is because of that journey that i've been on so i i would say give it time don't don't force the, the process to unfold um but accept that you can you allow yourself to to grieve to and let go of the guilt uh, um somebody's asking they can't join right now that your course but do you know roughly when it will be available in the future um as yet i don't because it really is dependent on several factors it's obviously we've got to get everybody that signed up in we're still sort of like getting everybody bedded in the next couple of weeks going to be quite busy getting everybody making sure that we've because i've got lots of things that i want to plan and lives and subsequent content that i'm i'm going to be up, uh, adding um but at the moment i'm not sure in truth um possibly depending on how it goes the other thing about the say for example the group is i i also have a um, I don't want it to be where I have you know because uh, uh, I because the way in which I run my groups is I'm I'm hands-on I interact so if you post a message on that group you will get me responding and I have several different groups for sports as well and sometimes it's always a work of managing your work-life balance and it can sometimes be quite intense so I have you know uh, 
online, I have probably about um, several hundred people that have access to me on a regular basis. They can they can message me, they, and that's a lot to manage. And I don't I don't nobody else does that for me. So I have to balance out about how many people I I offer that to um, with what's manageable for everything else. And at the moment, it's all manageable because obviously we're um, on. You know, I've got my work is different. My my structure of work is different, but as the the world opens up and I'm back to teaching and traveling, then it becomes a bit more about uh, more challenging. So in short, I'm not sure at present, but as soon as I have an idea, I will most definitely release it out publicly, let people know. Fantastic. Uh, Julie, yes, you can watch back later. Um, she's only just joined, that's fine. Um, let me see. Uh, Linda's had found that her dogs have really helped through awful grief and the lockdown as well. Yeah, um, this is really mm -hmm. yeah I think lockdowns brought up a lot of stuff for all of us, hasn't yeah, it? Um, in the last year. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Clara, Loki behaves differently when walked by me or my husband. He ignores the birds with Steve, but chases them with me. Steve totally ignores the birds, whereas I look at them and did some training with Loki to stop him reacting to them. I've now started to ignore the birds and he's started to ignore them too. Loki also chases cars, so I'm now not sure how we should progress with the training to stop the car chasing. I think my brain has fused. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like you're doing a lot of good work. I, I you know. I you know, to me, from what you've said, you've you've made headway, you've made progress. And the thing is, look for progress, not for perfection. Yeah. Don't look for I must master all my dog's issues in one here. It's an ongoing thing. Let line up on yourself. It sounds to me like you've made headway and you've made progress and you've got over one issue of the birds. Well, then you've got over the bird issue. You're definitely going to get over the car issue because that's just the next thing. Employ the same principle system. You know, I know that um, Lind, uh, Sarah did some stuff about car chasing get on board with that, you know, follow those principles and and acknowledge what, how far you've come. That's the thing to say to everybody is when you're in the midst of it, you can't see the wood for the trees. I urge people to record keep and keep a journal of your successes. And even if you put a calendar um, on, you know, get one made with your dogs, your dog, all different pictures of your dog on it if you want to, get a calendar, put it on somewhere where you see it every single morning, kitchen, fridge, um, in your bathroom, whatever, and put a, get a highlight. Every time your dog has a good day, tick across it, right? Tick across it. So you're going to get this every morning. You're going to get this influx of a visual um, a reminder of progress, yeah? Because sometimes we can look at it as when you've had a struggle with the dog, the dog does one thing. It's like, oh, well, that's it. That's that dog. I had, you know, I did a, a, a Zoom consult with somebody last night talking about this exact discussion in which she said she'd had a, a dog that had a, a regression in, in some behavior. And um, I was saying, well, so what's been happening of late? And when she recalled it, she went, actually, you know, the dog's done this well, this well, this well, and this well. And actually, she's in season. She's had this. We had to do this. Da, da, da. And you go, you, you, it's like she talked herself off the ledge and went, actually, you know, this is just me, you know, in that, you know, she would had a lot of things going on in her life at the moment. Uh, and that's a really important thing to do. Make sure that you don't lose sight of the progress that you've made. Yeah. Definitely. We have a weekly wins post in the academy so that people post those little steps. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. See. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, somebody was told they don't get the dog you want, you get the dog you need. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Amen to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Susan, you have to laugh. My noise sensitive slept through eight counts of breach of peace. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. Emma, strange you say about the dog for a reason. We chose ours from the pick of the litter. On first meeting, we thought about taking a different one, which my friend now has. She's an absolute dream. Um, Supper is a demon in disguise. Lovely indoors, total rudeness outside. <laughs> Brilliant. He's slowly getting there, though, so that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Kim, that was very useful mindset that every dog is here to teach me more. I found Kearney extremely hard to get along with, but now we're becoming a team. It's taken six Excellent. years. Excellent. Yeah. And it, like you say, it's not instant, is it? No. Um, no. Journey. Yeah. I, and yeah. that's, again, like the misconception again, you get your puppy home, you bring it in, you're going to fall instantly in love with it. No, it doesn't always work like that. Doesn't always work like that. Like I can honestly say, I've had dogs that I've always loved them, but it's taken a minute to really form a relationship with them, um, and and various reasons why. Um, but 
I definitely think that's more common. You know, it's the misconception that you um, you are going to instantly have that deep rooted. I love you and the dog loves. No, something like that. You've got to work at it like all things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, great. Julie, thank you. What an interesting life. Two fantastic trainers. Um, Helen, you online trainers are brilliant supporting us all. I hope you know how appreciated you are. A definite plus to the lockdown from my perspective. You make us feel better. Oops, um, our dog's happier and I hope sharing our wins helps you feel better too. Yeah, I don't know about you, Kamal, but I, I love seeing my clients when they post a win. Um, oh, however perfect. small, it's yeah. really great. I, I get, absolutely, you know, I get the, the, I get so invested with the people that I, um, I work with, really, really like, like, I'll lose sleep over their dogs and stuff. I mean, it's, it gets a bit ridiculous, really, you know, like I have an ongoing joke with some, some really good students in um, uh, America that I work, I coach regularly. And, uh, you know, I say that I've now got a, a profuse drinking habit on the dealing with all the infinite problems that, and I don't drink at all. But I said every time I resort to brown liquor because of their dogs and it's an ongoing joke. But that's a, talking about one of the points about finding the right person that takes time to develop that closeness. And, it you know, and it's a bit like it's a relationship. And I really get invested with the people that I work with. And I absolutely get I'm not going to sue everybody. Like I'm, I'm not that's my ego doesn't need you to go Kamal Fernandez is the savior of all it's fine I'm not and I don't want that label or but what I'll say is the people that I do work with and that we have that relationship I'm all on board I'm like I'm in the trenches with you I will back you a thousand percent whatever you need I will do my damnedest to help you and that's a really really important part and if I can do that on a social media allows me to do that on a larger scale um which I'm very privileged that people you know uh, want to listen but it, you know there is a there's a pros and cons of social media but I definitely think there is there is something beautiful in that being able to connect with people definitely yeah absolutely so I'd like to say a big thank you for coming and talking to the group today um, I think we're at the end of the questions so um, I hope everybody has a lovely weekend uh, just one last time tell them where they can find you if they want to uh, hear about your course yeah, so um, obviously you can go to relabelingreactivity.co.uk, which just in a very graciously shared. However, I absolutely get that in the current time, if you're not in a position to commit to it financially, I offer lots of free stuff on my Facebook page, Kamal Fernandez Dog Training, um, on Instagram, Kamal Fernandez Dog Training, and on YouTube, Kamal Fernandez Dog Training. So have a look at any of those resources and, um, you know, I, I'm – just yeah get on board and have a look I'm I always I, I'm a big one for just putting stuff out I don't believe in you know keeping it all to my go the more people you can help great you know the more knowledge shared the better so yeah and um, thank you very much for having me by the way thank you for coming along so good good weekend everybody enjoy the rest of your Sunday and we'll Take see you all. soon bye